who has done so much on this regard. They are the group who are entirely responsible for this report, the group that are entirely responsible for bringing these speakers, inviting the speakers, which we have today together. Um, person who they brought speakers out and spoken to the United States and much of the initiative that we've gotten, the rebirth in American interest over the past couple of years is due entirely so much to them and due to the Director of Relatives for Justice, uh, Mark Thompson. Mark, throw it to you to talk about the report and why you invited the AOH and LAOH to co-host this report. Oh, well, thank you, Martin. I suppose, first and foremost, that this is a justice issue. Um, Claire O'Reilly, as many people will know herself, a recipient of the Sean McBride Award from the AOH and LAOH, she had asked the legal intern, Potter Thompson, who's also my son, who's an undergraduate law student, to, uh, to, 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 to do a piece of work. And in particular, he spoke to Clara and Clara wanted all the information on plastic bullets consolidated into one document. There'd been so much disclosure over the number of years since the last pamphlet was done and that hopefully it could be used to generate a campaign to seek the ban on the plastic bullets. But more importantly, in the context of legacy justice, the thematic issue of the use of plastic bullets, the death and harm that they have caused, and the enduring legacy of impunity, uh, despite the fact that, you know, uh, there's, there's been nobody held the account, nobody brought before a court with any semblance of justice whatsoever, and the, 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 the struggle, the campaign by the families. So it was really to try and re reinvigorate all of that and to motivate and move forward as part of the kind of legacy package. As many people will know, we have a partnership with the Freedom for All Ireland, AOH, LAOH. That has been very productive. We've been able to go to Congress and the Senate. We've been able to lobby. We've been able to testify at hearings. We've been able to get con congressional and Senate members and other legislators throughout the US to write to the British ambassador, to put the British under pressure and, and, and to do that. And this external pressure that counts. We always say that, you know, when the US kind of sneezes, Britain catches a cold. And in some senses in these issues, that's that's quite important. So it's really about trying to motivate and do that. It's said that in the context of le legacy justice, it's probably important to also understand that the British are at odds with the Irish government in this issue. They're at odds with Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the Alliance Party. They're at odds with the Committee of Ministers to the Council of Europe that scrutinise the European Court rulings. They're at odds with the European Court. They're at odds with the United Nations. And they're at odds with Irish America on this issue in terms of legacy justice. And I suppose for the IOH, importantly, the Irish Catholic bishops, for the first time in over a decade, released a very stinging statement of the British government and their refusal to give to provide the commitments that they made in terms of legacy justice. So this is a thematic issue around justice, but it's also probably important to hear three families speak today from their own personal experiences. These families have been to the forefront of campaigning ever since their loved ones were killed. These people are why this issue is still around today. And it's probably important to say that these bullets, deadly as they are, still reside within the armory of the PSNI and could be used in the context of anything that happens. And the experience here in Ireland is invariably they're used against the nationalist Republican community. So if there are issues around the border poll, if there are issues around Brexit, these weapons could be used because they are the technology of political control and part of the British, they stem off opposition to any of their policies in our country. So it's also important to be mindful of that. So, you know, there are three relatives when you speak, they are the experts, they know their cases extremely well. They're, they're perfect examples of, of, of British involvement, of British injustice and the legacy of that. So, so and they're very brave for coming and speaking out and, 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 and it's not easy to speak out. It's usually, these are still hugely traumatic uh, events uh, and, and families live with them every day, every day. So viewers, please bear that in mind. Thank you. All right, we're now going to go to the first of the three families. And we should say they're all together 17 people who were killed. No British trooper, no member of the RUC brought to justice um, or face, has face justice. There was one, a couple of sham trials. Um, just want to mention this week we had the 40th anniversary of the first hunger strike. In 1980, there was a hunger strike in Lankesh led by Brendan Hughes. Tommy McCurney, Ray McCartney, Tommy McFeely, Leo Green, Sean McKenna, and John Nixon. And one of the ways in which the British responded to that campaign, the whole H block blanket protest, was to attack the community with plastic bullets. 
And they particularly did that in the lead up to the first hunger strike during the, the 1981 hunger strike and at various times, particularly around internment day rallies. So our first speaker is going to speak about family member being killed just on the internment day immediately, very quickly before the first hunger strike, just a few months before the first hunger strike that began on October 24th. Uh, brother, 21 year old Michael Donnelly was killed with plastic bullets just around the internment day weekend. And how the British, this was a particular time when support for the hunger strikers was building, when the British wanted to suppress it. And the way, one of the ways in which they suppressed it was uh, using plastic bullets on the streets of Belfast or Derry or in the North. So our first speaker, Frances Meehan, is going to talk about her family and the loss of Michael Donnelly, age 21. Frances. Thank you well, very much, Martin. I hope you can all hear me and a very good, good afternoon to you all or good morning, as it may be um, your side of the Atlantic or your side of the pond, as we would call it. Um, I'd like to maybe start off just by introducing um, all of you to my brother, Michael. Um, so I want to tell you a wee bit about him so that you can get a sense of who he was. Um, as Martin said, Michael was a 21 year old uh, young man from West Belfast, the family lived in West Belfast all our lives. Um, Michael was the eldest of seven children. I came fifth uh, in that family. Michael was a university student. He was studying sociology. Um, he had a keen interest in the arts and alternative cultures at a time when that wouldn't have been um, a thing that would have happened in Belfast. Um, Michael was, um, as I said, he was studying sociology and he worked uh, as a voluntary worker with a number of youth group groups and disability um, groups as well. He worked not only in Belfast, but across Nor Northern Ireland, across the North, um, and also in Liverpool and in England. So Michael had left home to go to university um, and he'd been out of the house for about two years. He'd been living um, across the other side of town. And on the night that he was shot, Michael was making his way home um, at around half one in the morning to our mother's house and he had a particular reason for coming home that night to our mother's house and he was making his way home and what Michael didn't know was that the street that he'd entered to make his way up to um, our parents home there had been rioting earlier in the evening so Michael came into the street entered the street um, and the citizens in the street the eyewitnesses were later to tell the family that the soldiers had essentially the British army had run amok and had been shooting plastic bullets at anything that moved. Michael, completely unaware of this, entered this street, started to walk up the street, and I witnessed someone who was sheltering in the hallway of a house, shouted over to Michael to be careful. And just as this person shouted that to Michael, a soldier turned the corner and shot Michael at point blank range from a, I suppose, a range of about 30 yards. Michael spun very quickly and um, done a, a full 360 spin and um, seemed to run for about 10 yards and then collapsed at which point two young men um, came out of a house and brought Michael tried to get Michael inside to bring him inside the house and um, while they were lifting Michael off the ground the soldiers continued to shoot plastic bullets at them they got Michael into the house and upon realizing that Michael was very ill one of these men put him over his shoulder and brought him to uh, St John's Ambulance, who was waiting at the top of the street. Um, whilst he was bringing Michael, carrying Michael over his shoulder to the ambulance, um, the soldiers continued to shoot plastic bullets at him. He eventually got Michael to the ambulance, at which point um, the soldiers came to the ambulance, surrounded it and refused to let the ambulance go to hospital. Now, the hospital, in comparison, distance-wise from where Michael was, was around half a mile or one kilometre. They held the ambulance for 20 minutes at the top of the street and refused to let it go. When they did let it go, the ambulance was allowed to travel about uh, 400 yards further up the road before the soldiers stopped the ambulance again. They held it for approximately another 20 minutes before letting, me, letting the ambulance make its way to the hospital, which was at that, that stage within touching distance. So there was a 40 minute delay to soldiers holding my, the ambulance that was carrying Michael um, up. When, when Michael got into hospital, he was dead 40 minutes after arrival. 
So my parents didn't know that Michael had been shot. No one came to tell them that Michael had been shot. We're still waiting on any kind of officialdom to actually tell us our brother is dead. Nobody told us that. It was actually an old neighbour of my parents that came to the door and said that a man had been shot and they thought that it was Michael. Um, They didn't know at this stage that the man was dead. Um, My parents went to the hospital um, subsequently to find out that, yes, it was Michael and their son was dead. Um, So um, after Michael's death, the impact in the family, as you can imagine, was absolutely horrendous. Um, My father, who was a very strong man, indeed, um, my father was a United States Army veteran, um, took Michael's death really, really badly. um, And he died nine years after Michael when he was in his mid 50s. Um, from cancer and I believe that you know part of the reason he died so young was the stress of, of Michael's of Michael's death and my mommy died when she was only 69 um, as well and again I think brought on the early early deaths due to the fact of, of Michael being murdered and them not able to get the justice or to get the truth of what actually happened to their son. Um, my parents spent um, all the years after Michael died trying to find out what happened and uh, we'd people tell us what happened on the ground. Um, part of the issue, and you'll find this with all of the cases um, of plastic bullet deaths and indeed other deaths, is that when the British Army or the RUC kills someone, um, in order to, I suppose, cover up what they've done, what they then do is they start to criminalise the victims. And this is exactly what happened in Michael's case. So when Michael was shot dead, he was a totally innocent victim. Um, And I talk about that a wee bit later on. But Michael was, um, his name was slated in the press. He was the the ringleader of a radis mob. Um, You know, the the media in in the North would have taken their, um, they weren't journalists. They were, they they just went to um, a hotel in Belfast and they were given press statements by the Northern Ireland office. So essentially the Northern Ireland office ran the media in Northern Ireland. And whatever the Northern Ireland office said happened to someone, well, that's what was printed in the press. Um, so my parents very much wanted to get the truth about Michael, um, both as an individual, but oh, but then about his death, because they knew what, what was being printed about him was untrue. Um, there was an inquest. We were lucky. We, we managed to get an inquest. Many, many families didn't get that. Um, really, in all honesty, not a lot come out of the inquest. All that the coroner said was that Michael was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I don't believe that. I, I have real difficulty with that statement. He wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in his own community. Um, he'd every right to be there. Um, and he was summarily executed for absolutely no, no reason. Um, my parents then wanted to, you know, they really fought very hard to see if they could get some kind of justice. It wasn't happening. So the only avenue that was open to them was to take um, a civil case for compensation. And they did that. Um, The outcome of that was that a judge um, in the Northern Ireland courts um, did say that Michael was killed at a time when his death was uncalled for and unjustified. Um, The judge didn't believe the evidence um, of the British Army. They believed the evidence of the eyewitnesses in Michael's case. Having said that, nothing happened. No one was ever held to account. The family never got no justice. We still didn't get any anything. We were still in the same place that we were before. So even though we'd had some semblance of having Michael's name cleared, no one was ever held accountable. Um, so if, if we move sort of forward over the years, my family have tried very, very hard to, to get the truth out about what happened to Michael and to get justice because ultimately he, he was my big brother. Um, and these weapons are not, riot control weapons, as the British media and the British Army and the establishment will tell you. These weapons are not riot control, they're people control. They're used to control people and to suppress people. And Mark said at the very beginning um, of, of, of his talk that they're still in the armory of the Northern Ireland uh, Police Service and in the, Brit- in, in the armory of the British Army, not used in, in England predominantly used against one community in Northern Ireland. Of the 17 people um, who have died, one of them was a Protestant, the rest were all Catholic. Eight of those were children, and yet these are rad, we're told these are rad control weapons. I want to dispel that myth. These are not rad control. These are people control, and people 
suppression weapons. They used to keep people down and they used to keep one section of the community down. And if my community in Northern Ireland tomorrow had a reason to go and protest, I have absolutely no doubt these weapons would be used against us again. And that's why it is so, so important um, that, that we continue to battle to have these um, removed. Moving on, I suppose, the situation is now that um, we've had all of these inquiries. We've had the historical um, inquiries, historical um, investigations. My family never um, were not happy with the investigation. The investigation was um, biased in its setup. I asked the investigators into Michael's uh, murder um, a series of questions. And they took it from that. They then became very aggressive towards me because I, I asked them, could I have, um, can I see the final version of their report unedited? Um, as it turned out, Michael's report never got finished. The report into his death was never finished. We then had um, Her Majesty's um, Inspectorate examine the work of the HET and they found it to be inherently biased and inherently biased against, um, you know, against the families and that they were they were really protecting um, the British soldiers um, rather than finding the truth, which is what we'd been told. They were more interested in protecting um, the families. Then we find out that actually the British government and the Ministry of Defence and the Northern Ireland office knew all along that these weapons that they were using in Northern Ireland um, were faulty. The weapons that they were using to shoot plastic bullets from were actually faulty. Um, they knew that and they knew that for a long, long time and they didn't withdraw it. So they essentially used the civilian population of the north of Ireland, one community, as their guinea pigs. They knew these weapons were faulty. They knew that they couldn't manage the, the trajectory. They wouldn't work. And I would like just to take a wee minute to show people on the call, if you've never seen what a plastic bullet looks like, I'm kind of hoping that you can see that. And I'm going to hold it up against my hand. Solid, solid plastic, fired from a gun at around 260 kilometers an hour, completely inflexible. You can't bend it, you can't push it, you can't do anything with it. Just going to tap it against my hand in a very slow motion so that you can see this. And I don't know if you can hear that, but you can imagine the impact of that when that weapon is leaving um, a gun at 260 kilometers an hour. That weapon is absolutely lethal. Um, so the idea of, and one of the tactics that the British government have used and the, the, the Ministry of Defence, the Northern Ireland Office has used, is the language of this weapon. They call it plastic, because somehow if you call it plastic, it's toy-like, it's innocuous, it's not real. This is very, very real. This is, this is an absolute lethal weapon. And they use it, so they changed it from being called a plastic bullet to calling it a plastic baton or plastic baton round. So they keep changing the language of it to make it seem even more innocuous. Um, this is not, this is an absolute lethal weapon. There have been numerous reports, both um, forensic reports, and I suppose um, oh. even, even their own forensic people, United States Army have done reports into, into plastic bullets and academic reports that the British government know about, um, that they've read, that they've seen. They know these are lethal weapons. They know that they're inaccurate. They still continue to use them. They don't use them on the British population. population. Um, whilst they do use them on both sides of the community in the north of Ireland, um, I would say 99% of the time they have been used in the north of Ireland has been against one community. And I think what is interesting, and, you, and you'll read this in Patter's report, is that during the time uh, when they were most used, um, in the early 80s, uh, my brother was murdered in 1980, Sean Downs, 81. And then after the hunger strike, you know, the, 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 there were thousands of these things being used daily, day and daily. The police force that were using these, the RUC, were 93% Protestant, and they were using them against a Catholic population. And that is essentially um, where we are. <laughs> we're still fighting for legacy, and we're still fighting for truth, and we won't give up that fight. And I really thank you very much for listening to me and to the others today because we need your help to get that. And we need your support to assist us to get access to the truth of what happened to our loved ones. 
Thank you, Francis. Um, do you want to do two things? Number one, if anybody has a question, I think Danny sent out a notice. Um, some of you have connections where you can do questions. You can send them in any time. If you have something for Francis, me in, send that in now. We have a question time that's reserved uh, after all the speakers, but Tim Noonan is going to read them out. He'll uh, take them down and he'll have them ready so you don't have to wait till that question time begins. You can send the question now and get it be the top of the line. Number two, in addition to everybody from the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians, uh, I did want to acknowledge that there are a number of other groups, Peter Kissel, for example, the Irish American Unity Conference, I heard from the Brehan Law Society. There are other groups that uh, did ask and are just uh, joining us on this video to watch to watch the important information that they, the speakers like Francis may have to provide to us and want to get involved in the campaigns. So I want to welcome all of those. And lastly, just before we go to the next speaker from Ireland, I certainly want to call on and acknowledge the Freedom for All Ireland Chair of the Ladies Ancient of All, uh, Ladies Ancient of, of uh, the Ladies Hibernians, uh, Dolores Stash. No, that's Thank you, Martin. Um, I just want to say, you know, what we just heard was was heartbreaking, and it's something that we've heard from a lot of the other families of um, state violence. The trauma, not only of losing Michael, of losing your family member, uh, that, that's that's horrendous enough, but the continual trauma that families have to go through. Number one, you talked, Francis, about criminalization of the victims. You know, I, I can't imagine what that trauma is like after you've you've had to deal with not only the family member being killed, but now your family having to explain this this was a victim. This was not a criminal. Um, and just the continued um, disregard for your family and the questions that you had where you were told, well, you know, those questions don't really matter, basically. Um, and the pain does not go away. And we thank you so much for sharing your story. And I think this is why we really want to support groups like Relatives for Justice, Mark uh, and Patter. Th this report that you've come out with is, is going to be shared with all of our members here. It's very, very important to get that out. And thank you for the work that you do with your team. Um, and this is why the LAOH will continue to support and the AOH, this, this great organization. Um, and you know, to, to the family members who, who are coming up and telling your stories, your stories are so important for us to hear. Um, and, and we really want to hear from all of you. And to the families that are on right now that may not be uh, speaking, just know that the, the ladies, Ancient Order of Hibernians, as well as the AOH, are behind you and we're with you. And we're hoping that you find justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. OK. All right, our next speaker, uh, in May of 1981, it was one of the most emotional events and momentous events in Irish history. Four of the 10 hunger strikers who died in 1981 would pass away during that month. Bobby Sands, Francis Hughes, Ray McCreesh, and Patsy O'Hara. And on May 22nd, a young girl named Carolyn Kelly, age 12, was killed. And to tell us about that, to represent that family and the injustice that followed, we have Mark Kelly. Mark, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming along and listening to my story today. Um, firstly, I want to say thanks to Francis. Um, I can see it's still very difficult, her loss, um, and we all feel for her. Um, and just listening to her and some of the stuff that her family and herself went through um, after the murder of her brother um, was the same for my family. Slight difference in my family is what Martin just said. There, my sister was 12 years of age when she was shot, and she was shot at the front door of her house. She was also shot in the back of the head behind her left ear. Um, I was standing about a metre from her when she was shot. It says that she died on the 22nd of May. She was in fact shot on the 19th of May and died pretty much instantly. Um, it was obvious to me. Uh, say she was 12 years of age. She was a young girl. Loved life. Just loved life. Always smiling. Always happy. Willing to help anyone. Dancing, singing. Kate Bush and Abba were her greatest loves in, in life. Um, she had many, many, many friends. Friends that actually around Twinburg today would still remember her. You could walk around and ask questions about her and people would still remember her. Um, on the night Carl Allen was shot, 
there was a night before uh, there was supposed to be an election. There was an election. The school and the estate had been taken over by the British Army to be used as a polling station the next day. And there was trouble at the school earlier that day. Um, some of the newspaper reports says that there was people rioting. They'd wrecked the school and damaged the school. The fact of the matter was the British Army smashed most of the windows in the school so that they could fire their bat rounds out, their plastic bullets out the window at anyone that was passing. Um, we were playing in the street. I was, I'm was, i just a year older than Carlan. Carlan was eighth born. I was seventh born in a family of 11. Uh, I was a year older than she would have been, or she is. We were all out playing. Beautiful, beautiful May night. It was a fantastic night. It was about five past nine. We could see where the Land Rovers come into the estate, if anyone's ever been into them. You could see from where we were, you can see almost the whole area around the estate, the main roads and the soldiers coming in. Of course, Bobby Sands had died on the 5th of May. Um, Julie Livingstone had been killed on the 12th of May, so there had been trouble. There had been rioting around the whole of the north of Ireland for some time. But it was such a good day, and everyone was sort of glad that they could get out of the house again because the trouble had been abating a little bit. Um, hunger strikers hadn't died um, until it was, I think it was the 21st of May when the next two hunger strikers passed away. Um, so everyone was out on the street, they were playing, they were enjoying it. It was still pretty bright for that time of the year. When we seen the Land Rovers coming in, a lot of the kids sort of went running towards their house. They all lived in sort of the immediate vicinity, weren't allowed to go too far, obviously, because of the trouble that had been going on. The army came in, drove around the estate, drove straight past the school, didn't stop at the school at all, and basically open fired with plastic bullets. There was two plastic bullets fired. The first plastic bullet that was fired was fired from a moving Land Rover, a children that were just down at the top of the street where we lived. Carlan had walked down behind the houses and heard the first bang. So I was a couple of feet behind her. When she heard the bang, she turned to come back behind the fence for protection. And that's when she was shot. Um, I just remember looking at her. I just seen her fall and she was just on the ground. As I say, I knew even at my age, I knew she was dead. The next thing I sort of remember is the two British soldiers came running up. There's a grass bank, like a little hill. Two British soldiers came running up the hill. The first of the soldiers threw his rifle on the ground. Like there was there was no chance of that ever happening if there was rat and gone. Um a soldier directly behind him picked his rifle up. The first soldier tried to give her first aid. There was a bit of animosity from the crowd. But my mother had seen what happened from the window when she came out of the house and told them to let the soldier help her. At this sort of stage, I went round into the house because I have two younger sisters and a younger brother who were in the house and I knew my mum was out, so I knew there was nobody in the house with them. So I went back round to the house then. Um, but after that, just going on from what Francis said, the lies that were told in the press, um, I actually have something that I'd like to read here, just take a second. But John Herman read, gave a statement to the newspaper the night before Carlan was to be buried. And in that statement, he said, um, the chief constable referring to the plastic bullet said it was tragic that some fatalities had occurred in riotous circumstances and that the weapon had been used against rioters determined to kill, wound or cause destruction. He said it was an alternative to a more severe measures um, which would in some circumstances be justified. I don't know how you can get more severe than the death of a 12 year old girl who shot in the back. There are many other stories in the newspapers that were printed about petrol bombs and stones and all sorts, just lies. I can say that completely because I was there. So I know it's just lies. The death of my sister just absolutely destroyed my mum. But my mum was very strong in a way that she had another 10 children to look after. She lived until 2010. She died 18 to December 2010. She never, ever, ever received justice from anyone or anywhere. The night after Carl Allen was shot, the British Army attacked our yeah. house, firing plastic bullets through the bedroom windows where they knew the children would be at the time of the night they were firing them again. It was about nine o'clock or so. They searched the house. Um, they made threats to my sisters and um, my brothers and other members of the family. So say my mum died, she passed away and she never, ever, ever got justice. My father passed away and never seen justice either. Um, 
I hope there's someone in Britain watching this because I want them to know that the families will never give up looking for justice. We're going to look for justice till we get justice, no matter where it takes us or what we have to do. And it's justice we're after. This isn't vindiction in anyone. We're not looking for to take people out and hang them. We are looking for a proper investigation into the death of our family, our family members. We want it to be impartial. We want it to be investigated properly. And we want to see that justice is done because without justice, there's just no proper society. It's, it's that simple. And that is why the importance of reports such as this and the help and the publicity from the AOH, the ALAOH, and other organizations around the world. It's very, very important that this message gets across and gets sent out around the world. And so that people know that their family members will never be forgotten. My, my sister will never be forgotten, and I'll never forget a lot of the other people who lost their lives. Um, so I want to thank everyone who's actually watching and listening today. I want to thank Mark Thompson. He's dedicated a lot of his life to helping a lot of other people. And Mark has had a lot of his own problems as well. Um, to my, or Peter, I want to thank Peter, young man, who hopefully I'll never, ever, ever have to go through a life that we went through growing up. But he is still there and hopefully he'll have a good life and he will help us get some justice for our family. There's just something I want to do. This is actually a picture of Caroline. That's what she was like um, as a young child. I just want to show you another picture. This is Caroline in her coffin. This is what the British Army do to our children, our sisters and our families. That's the way she was left. That's what my mom, mom had to look at and what we had to look at. We'll never, ever, ever rest until there's some justice for what happened to my sister. Okay. Um, our next speaker on August 12th, 1984. It was an internment day rally. It was attended by thousands of people, uh, including 130 Americans, including myself, including people from England, from troops out, including people from all over Ireland, uh, many from Belfast, but buses had come from other parts of Ireland. And what happened, uh, because just of a made up an excuse, is that there was an attack upon that entire rally. Uh, it was what called the best by Father Des Wilson the best documented case of a killing ever known after he did an inquiry. And that was the killing of John Down. Sean Downs was there with his wife, Brenda, and his young daughter. Um, as a result of premeditated action by the British and the Royal Ulster Constabulary to attack and suppress a huge numbers of crowds for attending that rally. So um, I'm gonna introduce, it's very emotional for me actually to introduce uh, Brenda Downs. Brenda. Uh, she just stepped away from her camera, so um, maybe we could uh, go on to a question, Martin. Can I, um, can I make a, can I say something? It's so different when we're sitting here listening to people's stories, and it's so emotional. And what I want all of our members to understand that this isn't newspaper articles. These are real people. I feel like I'm sitting at a table having, having a cup of tea with them. And they're still hurting all of these years because why? They haven't had justice. And this is now uh, what's happening in America on other issues, but also based on people from one particular group. We have to help people find justice. So please, please do everything you can. Listen to these stories and, and do what you can to help companies or organizations like Relatives for Justice. I'm sorry, I just that's the emotional mom in me because I'm thinking what it would be if it was my brother or my sister or my daughter. And it's just not acceptable. We have to get justice for people. Sorry, end of comment. Thank you. Just to follow up on what Karen said, um, these individuals, just like Bally Murphy, like some of the other speakers that we've had from Ireland, they not only had family members, loved ones killed, but then they got news reports that these are all rioters, that they were all guilty, that there was something uh, wrong, that these people had brought on their own action, shouldn't get any sympathy. The people who were supposed to be forces of law and order would actually insult them, be 
against them, would deny them justice, would use terms like there was a riot, there would be a cover up. They would try to block every opportunity for justice they had. In fact, one of the things I believe Brenda Downs is going to talk about when she joins us is a trial in which somebody was put on trial, Nigel, Nigel Hegarty, an RUC man, because it was so much publicity and attention, but that she was not even notified, no witnesses who would support uh, Sean, Sean Downs or John Downs were called. It was just a complete whitewash by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And since this report came out or the press releases about this report came out, um, I received several documents. A researcher, a student of Rowan O'Donnell named Robert Collins had actually uncovered a number of documents which go directly to the incident in which John Downs was killed. And what had happened is one of them is from an individual named uh, Anthony Townsend. It was sent out on the 16th of August, four days after John, John Downs was killed. And what it did is uh, the British were planning their publicity strategy for around the world to cover this up. And one of the things that they were going to do, uh, they had a letter and they had a cover letter. And then it emerged that they had some footage of exactly what happened at the time that John Downs was killed. And somebody suggested from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office sharing this footage around. And what he said was, Mr. Townsend, he forbade them from doing that. He said the implication of the footage would be by carrying a stick, John Downs made himself a legitimate target. Such an implication would inevitably increase the belief that a shoot to kill policy was in operation. Now that was what the British knew. I don't know if they're referring to footage that RUT, our uh, radio television, RTE had revealed or whether they have additional footage from helicopters, but they knew that what was pictured was a shoot to kill operation still wouldn't give any kind of real justice. And a second document that I want to uh, credit Robert Collins for unveiling at Q, the archives, is a document that on July 16th, um, eight people, British officials, attended a meeting at the British Home Office. There were legal advisors with the Northern Ireland Office, with the Home Office, the Republic of Ireland Department, the Immigration Department, and because it was an American delegation going over at that time, they were concerned about what to do. The delegation had attended 130 people, uh, were due to attend, 80 people had attended in 1983. They had met with people like uh, Jerry Adams. They had met with Martin McGinnis. They had met with uh, Quiven O'Kalen and Monaghan. They had met with others around the North. And what they were concerned about is because of the publicity and attention, that Americans attending along with members of troops out, along with people from all over Ireland, that, that should be in somehow blocked. So they originally talked about um, uh, deporting or blocking the 130 Americans in this meeting. It's a four page, uh, very considered brief, high level British officials. And then they decided that they, because I was the leader of the delegation, that they would simply deport me or issued some kind of immigration exclusion order against me. And then they realized that because just under Irish law at that time, uh, I was entitled to claim and did claim Irish dual citizenship of Ireland as well as America. And also uh, because of an international agreement that the United States had with Ireland, that they had to treat Americans or dual Irish citizens just the same way as they treated other citizens of the European community um, at that time, or European Union at that time, which meant they couldn't be banned on an immigration order. There are special rules preventing that. And they go through this and they explain how they were going to do it anyway, and because it suited them, even though they knew it was illegal, and they were hoping, you know, I'd probably be arrested, I'd come anyway, I'd be sent back, and they would get some good publicity from this. They could explain that in the United States. And... Uh, that would be the end of it. They could intimidate anybody else from America from speaking out on these issues. And instead what they decided to do, obviously sometime between um, that date when the meeting was held, July 16th, 1984 and August 12th, was that as soon as I was called to the platform by Jerry Adams, they would attack everyone who was at that rally. They would attack with plastic bullets. They would attack with Land Rovers. They would drove into the crowd. They attacked with clubs. 
It would make anybody who was killed or injured a rioter, which although people who are actually kneeling or sitting in the streets at the request of Jerry Adams, although they knew in it well in advance that they would not have any difficulties or problems, that this would be peaceful. Uh, the chairman was actually somebody named Dennis Donaldson, who would be exposed as an informer later on, but confirmed that everybody in the area, all the Sinn Féin members confirmed that. And in fact, before I got on the platform, Jerry Adams and others asked everybody to kneel or sit in the streets that there would be no problems. And yet the British were able to open fire with plastic bullets. They were able to attack. Uh, there were Americans who were seriously injured. There were men, John Downs, who came to that rally that March on a Sunday afternoon, uh, simply to hear words of Jerry Adams, words of other speakers at an internment day rally, the appeals for justice in 1984 in Belfast, the place where he lived. And it's just a community attack that went out and the efforts that were made after that. I don't believe there's ever been an inquest. Somebody had to be put on trial at some point because of a public inquiry conducted by Father Des Wilson, because of all the publicity, because a number of American congressmen wrote letters about the incident. There was a congressional hearing held about the incident because of so many Americans, because of so many television cameras there. Everybody could see what happened. And still the British persisted. They had a sham trial, as I said, uh, in which the individual fired the plastic bullet from point blank range that even the British officials knew showed a shoot to kill policy, open fire, um, he was just simply acquitted. Nobody except all you see witnesses or people favorable to them would be called. Uh, Brenda Downs, who we're hoping to have on the program, was not even notified that her husband's killer would be on trial. Had to read about it in the papers after the case began. It was a trial that lasted three or four days. It was a sham. It was a whitewash so they can say it had gone to trial. That's the type of effort that the British had put in to do a cover up of what happened. Michael Donnelly, a cover up of what happened to Carolyn and Kelly, and a cover up of what happened to every one of these 17 families. And um, I know it's very difficult. I don't know if Brenda had to leave because she She's couldn't talk about it here. Brenda's set to go. Brenda's set, set to go. go. Um, well, Brenda, you got the longest introduction of anybody. I've gone into mm -hmm. it. And without further ado, somebody I'm honored and very glad that she's here with us. Um, welcome to introduce Brenda Downs to talk about her husband, the events of 1984, where her husband was murdered, and the cover-up that continues to this day to prevent her and her family and so many families from getting justice. Brenda Downs. Thank you. Um, hope you can hear me okay. And I just want to um, thank everybody for this opportunity to be able to um, speak around John's case. And as you've already heard Martin saying um, about the injustice and the lack of justice after he was murdered, John's is probably one of the most well-known cases as the film footage went around the world that day and it was shown as a police riot uh, on a totally defenseless population. We had attended the anti-internment rally on the 12th of August, 1984, as internment, as some people may not know, where people were put into jail without trial. And it was to show that we did not accept this and that this was British rule being enforced on the Irish people. Myself and John and our baby daughter attended that rally that day. Um, and little did we know that I would come away and John would be dead. As I say, it was a peaceful demonstration until Mark Galflin came onto the platform and the police viciously moved in, battening women, men, children. They drove their Land Rovers through them, smashing the cameras from the media. And it was absolutely horrendous. Uh, it was a total unprovoked attack. And at one stage, Jerry Adams had asked the people to sit down on the ground that we had every right to be there. It was a peaceful demonstration. This call went unheard from the RUC. We had taken up their positions that morning from the early hours. 
the march had left in the Dunbar Park and the Stoyles Road going to Connolly House. And on the way up, every corner, every street was lined with RUC men heavily armed with their guns. It was a total unprovoked attack. attack. And what I really want to stress here today, and you've listened to Francis and Carlin's um, brother, it was the injustice that's been dealt out to everybody when somebody has been murdered by their loved ones. They're demonised. In my own case, it was said that John was a rider and he was going to the defence of his colleagues where the film footage was later shown a few days later, where it showed Nigel Haggerty, Haggerty the RUC reservist, who aimed directly at my husband's chest and fired the plastic bullet directly into him. They covered it up originally before the footage was shown. They said, Herm, John Herman said it was a ricochet bullet that hit him. Right from the start, they told their lies. After the press, because it got so much publicity, the British government obviously had to be seen to do something. They charged Nigel Haggerty with manslaughter. Firstly, it was murder, reduced to manslaughter. Nigel Haggerty and the whole court case was a farce, a total farce on that day. He himself did not give evidence in a courtroom. I myself wasn't informed that the trial was taking place. My father-in-law had tried to get into the court and was told there was no room and was denied being a part of the hearing. Nigel Haggerty was acquitted on self-defense of his colleagues who were heavily armed and well protected. And the video evidence proves, proves this. So in, in light of that new documentation that has come out, given the decision to ban Martin Galvin from that day, the secret document that they had all these years proves that there was a need for a proper investigation, which they have failed to do. The charge Nigel Haggerty, because it had to be seen to be doing something, but didn't hold account the British government who took the decision to ban Martin Galvin from attending that rally. It was a political decision. So in light of the new information, I would pay the people to give testimony, give evidence, of what they've seen and witnessed themselves this day, to put pressure on the British government to look into this case. Because it's 36 years from he's be, been murdered. It hasn't gone away. We haven't gone away. Plastic bullets haven't gone away. The injustice hasn't gone away. We need this addressed. And there have been lots of Americans who were there on that day who were at the receiving end of RUC brutality. So with the new evidence coming out, with it being a pre-planned operation, they knew exactly what they were doing on the day of John being murdered. Many of you can give testimony and statements to my solicitor, Michael Bratlow, and Karen Cunningham, who put in for an, an inquest. As I say, I was even denied an inquest on the grounds that Nigel Haggerty had a trial, which there was no trial, there was no representation on my behalf, and said wasn't even in the court. So I would appeal to people to put the pressure on to bring these people to justice. To clear our loved one's name and for 
us to be able to move forward in, in this community. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but given the circumstances at the minute um, and the revelation of the new documentation, it would be appropriate if people contacted the solicitor with stuff that they've seen and heard and, there, and, and any evidence that they can produce. Thank you, Brenda. I know that's very difficult for you as it was very difficult for all the speakers to talk about their family members. I am in touch with Michael Brentnell Law and uh, Kieran Cunningham who are working on the case. They're trying to make an application to get a, a, an inquest to get the truth uh, in this case. And uh, if anybody, I know I've already been contacted by some of the 130 Americans who were present on that event who would be willing to do affidavits to give evidence. The more pressure we can bring on the British government, the better chance there is that they'll at least give an inquest, one of their proceedings that should have been granted a long time ago and give some avenue of truth. So if anybody has any information, these documents just came to us from Robert Collins, a student of Rowan O'Donnell's and they added a lot to the case. We're looking for other documents, other affidavits, and we'll present them. I'll present them to Michael Brentnell and Kieran Cunningham to um, work on the, on the, who are working on the case. All right, we're next. I, I just want to clarify one other thing. Just British government knew that the ban on me was illegal. They still use that as an excuse to an attack a whole crowd in these confidential documents. They're just talking about me being picked up at some point and sent back and deported, how that would be very easy. It would be bad publicity for them, but that would be okay. Some point in time, after that date, nearly a month until August 12th, they made a decision, we're not just going to do this, report this person under an illegal ban. We'll use this to brutalize and attack and indeed to murder uh, people in, in Belfast on August 12th. That's what that, that represents. And that's why families like these in all of these cases are looking for justice. Okay, we're now going to turn to questions. Tim, uh, we're going to turn to Tim Noonan, who's on the FFAI committee. Uh, are there any questions in for any of the speakers? And I, again, I want to thank each of them. I know it's very difficult to relive these. You can tell this everything is heartfelt and how important this information is for us. Tim Noonan. Uh, yes, uh, there's several questions. Uh, actually, I think Danny got the first one there, right? Yeah, um, Francis, if you could take a, a minute and tell us uh, briefly about your meeting with uh, the British Secretary Bradley and what his thoughts were on the British killings. Okay, so um, Karen Bradley um, is the secretary or was the secretary of state for Northern Ireland. And she made a statement to the House of Commons, just to give you some background to, to her statement. There is a lot of political pressure <coughs> in um, the English parliament, a lot of pressure coming from them to exonerate completely. Um, all soldiers who committed murders and atrocities in the north of Ireland from prosecution. We have had one, one soldier um, from Bloody Sunday who is um, being tried for murder. Only one um, out of all of the soldiers who were involved in that. And this soldier um, hasn't, hasn't actually got into court yet. But because this one soldier, if you like, has been charged with um, murder, what happened, there was a huge backlash in the English political classes, British polit political classes. Um, and they're working very hard to make sure that no other soldier ever is prosecuted for anything in relation to the troubles period in the north of Ireland. So Karen Bradley stood up in the, in the Houses of Parliament and she made a statement around this. And she said, I, I don't think I'll ever forget her words. Um, she said, there was no criminality whatsoever by the British um, army in the north of Ireland and the soldiers acted proportionately and in a dignified manner. Well, I got to tell you, I'm sure Mark and Brenda um, are sitting there now um, and I'm sure their blood was boiling when they heard that statement because mine was and my entire family's blood was boiling. So I got a phone call later on that evening um, uh, from Mark Thompson and he said we're arranging a meeting with the Secretary of State would you like to come and meet her 
And I know my my sisters were saying to me, oh, you know, don't be going to meet her. You know, how could you sit in the room with a woman like that? And I says, I want to sit in the room and I want to look at this woman. I want to eyeball her. I want to look into her eyes. And I want to speak to her. Um, and I want her to see that my brother was murdered, was murdered by one of her soldiers, one of these soldiers that she, that she talked about being dignified, one of these soldiers that she said yeah. were not criminals. And I want to tell her right, exactly. So, sorry. Um, so anyway, what we, we did attend the meeting with Karen Bradley. And she apologized. Yeah. I would just have to handle the questions. There's a number Sorry, of people is somebody here, speaking Heather? who's not on mute? Uh, to... Go ahead, Francis. Sorry. So there's a number of number of families who met Karen Bradley. Not just the families of plastic bullet victims, but the family the families of other murder <coughs> victims. And we all all of the families told her exactly how they felt. And one of those families who was there was uh, Stephen McConaughey's family. And Stephen McConaughey was an 11 year old child who was murdered in Derry by a plastic bullet. And his family showed Karen Bradley a photograph of Stephen, a bit like what Marks just did, a week before um, Stephen was murdered, and then showed her a photograph and said, look at this lovely 11-year-old wee boy, beautiful, happy child, and look at him lying in his coffin. That's what your dignified and proportionate soldiers do. So when Karen Bradley, when it came round to me, she apologised profusely. Um, I asked her to, to make an apology in, in the House of Commons. Um, I told her that she could apologise all she wanted. The only thing that I would accept from her was her resignation. Um, I didn't accept her apology. Her words were very, were said with, with intent. She knew exactly what she was saying. She knew the hurt that those words would cause not just to me, but to every single family um, out there, to Mark's family, to Brenda and her daughter, to all of the other victims. She knew exactly what she was doing. And this is all part, I believe, of a wider um, programme within the British establishment, if you like, to stop the prosecution of soldiers who committed murder in the north of Ireland. It is ongoing. It is relentless. Um, it, you know, Every day you're nearly hearing something more about it. You have all of these Tory MPs who have focus groups and pressure groups so that we as families, not only do we not get justice, we don't even get the truth about the, the, the circumstances surrounding the deaths of our families. And, you know, when I sit here today and, you know, I have never met Mark um, Kelly before today. I haven't met Mark. I've, I've met Mark's brother, but I've never met Mark before. And I listen, I can see the hurt when Mark was talking about his wee sister. And Mark witnessed her being murdered in front of his own eyes. Um, and I can see that 39 years later, the hurt's still there. Because for me, 40 years later, the hurt's still there. And you know what? Nothing will make that hurt go away until we get the truth. And until we get the state to admit that what their army did when it was on the streets of the north of Ireland was absolutely wrong and that they did murder innocent people. They did have a shoot to kill policy. Um, they, ne they need to start admitting what they did to allow us to move on and to move forward. People have often said to me, why are you still going on? It's 40 years. What is it that you want? Do you want these soldiers to go to jail? Look, I'd love them to go to jail. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I don't want the soldier who murdered my brother to go to jail. I absolutely do. But realistically... I know that's never going to happen, but what I would like to happen is I would like someone in the British establishment to actually say, we did wrong. We murdered these people and it was wrong um, because there's still people, quite a lot of people in the north of Ireland who believe that if, you're, if your loved one was murdered by the British Army or by the RUC, well, then they must have did something to deserve it. Do you know, and, and that, that's part of this wider conversation with Karen Bradley. It's about protecting the British soldiers and the RUC from prosecution so that they can hide the truth from us as families about what happened to our loved ones. Okay, I think Dolores Fesh has a question for Mark Kelly. Uh, yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, Mark, I had a question for you. You mentioned earlier that there were um, the treatment of your family after Carol Ann was killed. Did you... Um, 
I couldn't hear all, all of it, but were you saying that <coughs> your house was actually attacked after Carol Ann was killed? Yeah. Um, the night, Dolores, the, the, the night after Carol Ann was shot, the 20th, um, all the kids were obviously kept in the house. The estate was in chaos. Um, so there was very few children on the street. But the soldiers come in and we were actually out. I'll never forget it. We were in the back bedroom of the house and they shot um, bullets, the plastic bullets uh, through the window of the house at us. Um, thankfully, we were able to get onto the bed and, and hide. But um, the, the intimidation went on for many years after it. I have older brothers and older sisters and they were intimidated. Um, the machine that goes into action when they murder someone in the north of Ireland starts off with press releases um, trying to defame the, the people who were murdered and killed, uh, trying to say they were rioters and their family was this. and it, It's just all part of the intimidation of the British machine to try and make you look like you were doing something wrong. Um, the problem they had with Carl Ann was that because she was shot in the back and there was witnesses, there was a lot of witnesses, it was very difficult for them to pursue that even though they did in the press quite a bit. So they then started to intimidate the family quite a bit. Um, like I've never been spoken to by the police about this. I've never been interviewed and I was standing less than three feet from her. I know a few of my friends that were there, they've never been spoken to. There's been no investigation whatsoever into this. Um, just what Francis was saying there, but why do we continue this fight? I don't think you can give up when you watch your family being murdered on the streets. You can't just stop. You don't give up. But I seen a report there that was done in the Guardian newspaper last year that the British were training up to a thousand police officers in England and Scotland to use plastic bullet guns in case of a no deal Brexit and there may be some yeah. civil disorder in the north of Ireland. So these bullets are still there. They will be used again in Ireland and they will take people's lives. And without the help and without the lobbying and without the fight, the British government and the British army and the RUC will continue to go on and use these weapons to murder other people. Uh, Tim, do we have time for any more questions? Uh, yes, uh, there, uh, there is some, a question about the ramifications of Brexit in regards to, uh, to this, uh, the policing. Is there any things that- we Mark, do you want to take that? If there is any, I don't know that there is, are any Brexit that relates directly to this issue, but is there anything or what any way which, or Mark Thompson, I was going to ask, would you, uh, um, just Brexit relate directly to this? Yeah, issue? well, well, you see, as I said from the outset, if there were any issues or protests, civil and legitimate peaceful protest uh, around Brexit or around the border pull, or around any political issue where people, uh, you know, express their civil right to go to the street and, 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 and voice opposition, um, it could, the, technically these bullets could be used. They're still in the armory of the PSNI. They have not been banned, despite the whole Patton report and the commission and the policing, um, which stopped short of calling for an outright ban, but the spirit of Patton and the way it was supposed to be taken forward was what they, they were to be banned, and they never were. Mm -hmm. And they've been used, uh, you know, off and on. They haven't been used in a while, but the point is the PSNI retain them, they stockpile them, they update those stockpiles. And if there are any kind of concerns around the Good Friday Agreement that was undermined by Brexit, the Good Friday Agreement is predicated on civil liberties and protections of human rights. The very foundations, which were the opposite of the experiences that you have just heard. And I suppose with the change in tide with US influence in the police process, the Good Friday Agreement and the promotion of human rights and all of those things and the change in, like Brenda's talking in her, her instance about trying to get the inquest reopened, old inquests didn't compel police officers or soldiers to kill the people. They could not be cross-examined. They simply submitted uh, pre-prepared statements by their lawyers. The inquest really only delivered a death certificate. It didn't go into the circumstances around uh, the killing beyond who was killed, what date they were killed on, and who was responsible, and then a death cert. Inquests always happened in the context of a failure uh, to prosecute 
where investigations were not independent or impartial, where the public prosecutor didn't provide sufficient public reason why they did not prosecute, when in the public level there was sufficient and prima facie evidence that would have warned prosecutions. And so Relatives for Justice, along with Madman Fanuk and Solicitors and the Committee on the Administration of Justice, with a set of families, the Loch Gall families, the families of the shoot to kill incidents of November and December 1982, the killing of Pierce Jordan and the killing of a Sinn Féin election worker, Patrick Shanahan, went to the European Court in May 2000 and filed not under the right to life in terms of the person being killed, the actual right to life itself being violated, but the fact that we knew within the jurisdiction in the north of Ireland that the domestic investigative processes were deliberately uh, perfunctory, that they could not deliver truth and justice to families, and that they were constructed in such a way to deliver uh, the exoneration of those responsible and to provide impunity and not to, to get accountability. And so what, what we did strategically is we put the Article 2 obligation of the investigation and the a death in suspicious circumstances are at the direct hands of the state. We put that itself on trial. And in May 2001, the European Court unanimously determined that the system of investigation within the jurisdiction in the north of Ireland was deliberately at fault and in violation of the convention rights to properly and independently investigate. Now, you don't put a government in jail. What you do is you supervise that government and you work in partnership with that government who have an international and domestic legal obligation to properly investigate. So you turn that around and you ensure and you supervise to put in place the proper procedures. And that's what the battle has been over two decades. Now, technically what happens is that's done in quite a short period of time, probably up to a year, year and a half maximum. And the Committee of Ministers to the Council of Europe and the Committee of the Execution to the Council of Europe connected to the European <coughs> supervise and sign off and say we have now put in place those mechanisms and the government and our supervision of them is now ended. It has not ended since May 2001 since that judgment's been delivered. The British government are still in default. They haven't changed sufficiently enough or, or investigated. And that's what the problem is. And when we use the European court and we use the United States and when the LAOH and the AOH and the Freedom for All Ireland Committee and all the other groups and legislators in the US and the Congress and Senate people get on board and we battle and we use international pressure, then what we get is this backlash that, oh, these are our heroes, these people in Belfast that shot these children. They can't be held accountable because it's about a battle for narratives. And that narrative will overturn the perpetuated and propagated narrative by the British state that they were the good guys, the men made some mistakes, when in fact, we will see that they were up to their next inclusion, they were organizing and corrupting the rule of law to cover that and to protect their troops. And just one example, just the on it, many of you will have seen the film on Quiet Graves, based on the book by Anne Kidwallet, her lethal, lethal allies. The filmmaker has given a voice for the first time, the victims of collusion, empowered families, and told that story. And he's made a settlement yesterday afternoon with some of the kind of pro-British papers that tried to vilify and undermine him. And so when families get a voice, they're, they're attacked in the press, they're vilified, and then they attack the filmmakers. And this is the type of stuff that's going on, and that's what Karen Bradley was at that time, and it was important to go look her in the eye, as Francis said, and confront her, and say to her, we don't accept this, so we're taking it on, but we're taking it on with your help, and that's what's important. One other Thank point, you. sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I, I, I really don't want to go on. There's one little thing I, I probably want to say that's important for a lot of your, your audience. I, I, and it's, it's slightly connected, but kind of off it because, you know, the, the AOH, LAOH is a big, big institution and it's an Irish heritage and, and it's background in religion as well. Uh, Mark Kelly and I are friends, childhood friends. Um, we grew up together in the same area. I, I came on the scene when the ambulance had just left with Carol Ann. Um, the green in the front of Mark's house is where a lot of us hung out as young teenagers, you know. Um, in the, on the 30th of September 1979, the Pope came to Ireland and he blessed the foundation stone of St. Luke's Chapel in Twinbrook. Um, the chapel opened at the end of March in 1981, finished construction. And one of the first, if not the very first person buried out of the chapel was Bobby Sands. The first child to be buried out of the parish and out of the new chapel was Carol Ann. And uh, 
we'll have just tweeted a picture or some pictures, hopefully, um, because I've just been on my phone checking. When Mark talks about the home being attacked, we've put up a picture of the neighbor's house to Mark, who was a witness to it, where not only their house was fired into the Kelly's house, but they fired into the Oscar household and other households, the plastic bullets, to intimidate the witnesses. And you'll see a picture of the bullet lodged in the wall of the house, where it went through the window and lodged itself in the kind of the wall. And, and that should be on our Twitter, but it, it's just to reiterate and, and, and to show those facts. So, you know, but, it, but, but I want to hand it back over to yourself, Martin, and to hear more from families. Uh, Mark, excuse me, is on the relative justice Twitter? Sorry, just want to yes. add to, uh, in yes. terms of Brexit, you know, one of the things that I, is ironic, uh, the British now are trying to change the agreement that they had, that had been ratified, and they're simply trying to pass an internal markets bill which uh, just breaks that unilaterally. And people are saying that the Brexit is causing a lot of mistrust uh, with the British government. And there's not the trust that there was in the past. Uh, somebody who studies the whole history of legacy, what they've done with the Storm and House Agreement, some of the other things that they promised on legacy and just retreated from and just unilaterally just didn't seem to th feel they could break any promise that they made. I don't know why there was any trust to begin with how you would get the mistrust. Okay, Tim, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, you know what? Actually, there's a question about um, that there's been a lot of reports in regards to plastic bullets. And I think this one goes to Peter uh, in regards to uh, his excellent report uh, that is going to be released later. Uh, would you be able to discuss uh, a couple items on the report uh, and how you came to, uh, to the conclusions of the report, Peter? Um, yeah. Um, so first off, the report, kind of came about as Mark mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, I met with Claire Riley, um, who was a founder member along with Emma Groves of the United Campaign Against Plastic Bullets. And that campaign came about after Clara had witnessed the killing of, um, uh, Forgive me, I can't remember who it was that she had witnessed the killing of. Um, Brian Stewart, it was Brian Stewart. Um, forgive me there. Um, and I have known Clara all my life, um, because as Mark said, I'm Mark's son, and I remember growing up always attending the plastic bullet vigils. Um, so I had a, a strong connection with the uh the the bomb plastic bullets campaign um my entire life and i remember growing up holding um the bomb plastic bullets placards every year and seeing the pictures of the 17 people who have been killed um but other than that i never i didn't really have too much knowledge on who these people were on who these families were who these victims were um, so a main driving force for me for this report was to not only collect all the information um, and the, the uh, documents and collate all the information that had been put together in the reports, but to also um, get a sense of who each of these people were so that they were no longer uh, seen as plastic bullet victims but that these were actual people behind the statistics. Um, and I wanted for people to get to know who each of the victims were. Um, so I began research for the report. Um, firstly, going back to the early reports done by Father Des Wilson, Father Fall, and the United Campaign. So, uh, Claire Riley and Emma Groves, the reports that they were putting together. And I was starting to get some information just around the uh, numbers that have been reported on being fired. I was starting to get some information around the sectarian use of the weapons, where the weapons were being used, who they were being used against. Um, and I was kind of getting some information from newspaper archives on public statements that were being made by the RUC and the British Army at the time. Um, um, what was what I found quite difficult to find was actual scientific and medical 
research into these weapons. So as a result of probably deliberate um, del deliberate hiding on the part of the state, it was quite difficult to access in public records where this information was. So because um, uh, kind of around the 1998 kind of peace transition, there was a good look at policing in the north of Ireland and the Patton report had come about and Patton had recommended uh, research be carried out and into the search for an alternative into the use of the plastic bullet. So as part of that, there was an organisation, the Omega Research Foundation, who had done an extensive report on the ballistic and medical impact of the plastic bullet. So I started to look into that and I was absolutely shocked by what I had found. So to give an example, um, the ballistic research that the Omega Research Foundation um, had found, which is included in the report, is around the accuracy of the weapons. So they had said one in three rounds of the weapons that they had tested missed their target. They had found that if a bullet misses their target due to the impact, as Francis was able to kind of really well illustrate because of the, the size of this weapon and the energy of which it leaves the weapon, it leaves the, the gun it's fired from. So the kinetic energy that it, these bullets carry carried with them a very serious in a very a very serious threat to life so i kind of did uh the appears that pedro seems to be frozen um he did a fabulous job in this report, and uh, if he freeze up here, uh, we'll let him uh, wrap it up. All um, right, we we're going to have we are going to have closing comments by Danny O'Connell, by Mark Thompson, then just myself. First of all, uh, Danny O'Connell, the national president of the Ancient Order of Librarians. Thank you, uh, Martin. Um, what an incredible, what an incredible job by Peter Thompson, uh, bringing um, to light at probably a critical time to have this report released. Um, I wanna thank all our speakers, our, our prayers and are with you. And more importantly, um, we represent a large, the largest Irish organization in the United States. And you've got a lot of people behind us. Um, behind you, and uh, the LH, the AOH combined, uh, we're with you. God bless you and thank you for your time. Okay, now the person who's the director of Relatives to Justice, the group that put together this report and who did us the singular of honor of inviting the AOH and LAOH to co-launch or co-host the launch with them, Mark Thompson. Mark. Yeah, listen, I don't wanna take up any more time. It's just to thank everybody. It's to keep the hard work going. I'm very humbled they have listened to Brian uh, Francis and Mark today, it's powerful. It, it, often I like to see the link broken with England, but not the communications link in this occasion. Um, but but, 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 but I, I'm very humbled and honored to have listened to those stories as I sure all the audience will be. So, so, so th thank you, thank you. A few years ago, a, a British secretary, Theresa Villiers, uh, talked about something, the pernicious counter narrative. Now what those are are very high sounding English words and what they mean is that if the truth comes out, told by people like Francis Meehan, like Mark Kelly, like Brenda Downs, the truth comes out about what British troops, what members of the RUC, what Crown forces did to Irish people to remain in the north of Ireland illegitimately, uh, that's going to destroy all the lies, all the stories, all the myths, all the narratives. I call them fairy tales that the British tell to justify remaining in the north of Ireland. I know I was very deep, I know these stories and I was very deeply moved hearing them again from people they are really heartfelt is the only word I can say. We are very grateful to you. We pledge the Ancient Order of Hibernians and LAOH to continue to work with Mark, with Relatives to Justice 
so that all of the families who are victims of British injustice will get some sort of justice and that all of the families in the north of Ireland will get what they're really entitled to, which is the real justice of freedom for all Ireland. So I want to thank you. And I want to tell you, we are now going to use today as a springboard to raise more money or to support reports like this. Our imprint is on the Relative to Justice Report, both the AOH and LAOH. We're going to use this in terms of political action to get you the truth and the justice that you're entitled to. And again, none of us are going to forget what you told us and it's meaningful to us and it motivates us. So I want to thank everybody. And I know the highlight of this is that Danny O'Connell is now going to push one of those magic buttons that a computer illiterate like me does not understand, which will make the entire report available to everybody to read. So I want to, again, thank Danny, Mark, all the speakers, everybody who joined us. And I know if you feel like I did, this was really a worthwhile and important day for us. Thank you.